Thank you so much for the generous introduction. Um, I literally just walked in here. Um, the, um, I want to share with you my thoughts on the uh, AI disruption, but first, um, a lot of people, because of the uh, explosion of generative AI, seem to think that this is a field that is like that started in November of 2023, um, 2022. No, it did not. It actually started a long time ago. Uh, the term artificial intelligence came out in 1956. It was coined by this gentleman, John McCarthy, and Marvin Minsky um, gave it that first definition. And uh, I happened to, both of them happened to have been uh, great teachers of mine. Uh, McCarthy was the head of my qualifying exam during my PhD at Stanford, and uh, Marvin wrote my recommendation letter that got me into Stanford. Um, more, more recently, and over the course of my studies, I had a lot of opportunity to work on AI. And so, um, I, the, um, more recently, when I was at Infosys, we had an opportunity to invest in OpenAI. Um, OpenAI was at the time a nonprofit. This was 10 years ago. And this is from OpenAI's founding blog. Um, we gave $3 million or so to the, uh, as a donation to OpenAI, and then I served on OpenAI's advisory board for the very for the first two years. I want to take we you have a to today. Very nice wireframe here. Let's watch this uh, video. An application that we're going to try building with GPT-5 and Cursor. We're going to bring this into Cursor, and we're going to put this wireframe in, and we're going to ask GPT-5 to go and try and build an application from scratch. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is actually uh, pretty amazing. So what happened there, that was Greg Brockman, one of the founders of OpenAI sitting on the right and on the left was the founder of Cursor, which is a software development startup. This was last week during um, OpenAI's GPT-5 launch. What he did was he gave a wireframe, a picture of an application that he wanted to construct. Um, and gave it to GPT-5, chat GPT, inside the cursor development environment and asked it to make this. And literally within minutes, three minutes, four minutes, it prepared that application. So at the end of that video was actually the application that he had on the wireframe working. Um, I encourage you to watch that video. And if you have not already done that, um, it is quite an extraordinary experience to go to one of these tools, Claude or or ChatGPT or Gemini, and have them make you an application that you want to run on your Android phone or your iPhone or on your browser. Uh, it is astonishing how, uh, how fast non-programmers can actually build a piece of software and get it to run. So one conclusion I think we clearly can make is that Gen AI is extremely empowering to people who are creative, whether it is um, writing documents or essays, poetry, stories. We have all seen these examples, making pictures, making videos. I have a um, picture of Adobe Firefly, which is a, has a wonderful capability to generatively fill a picture if you have only a part of a scene or something like this, uh, or all kinds of ways to recreate movement, create videos, uh, create new models. Um, so people who are creative, even for scientists to create hypotheses, to come up with ideas, whether it is in drug discovery or all of these kinds of fields. Um, people who understand what has to be done with AI, all of a sudden have this extraordinarily powerful capability in their hands to build whatever it is that they want to, uh, that they want to build. And yes, AI hallucinates a lot. It is a very fundamental limitation of AI. But in the hands of creative people, people who understand what they are doing, it's a really powerful tool. And of course, when it comes to software development. So I just showed you an example of how easy it is now to build software. Whether it, you can not just build a new app, you can do debugging of existing code, legacy code. You can drop a piece of code in um, one of these tools and say, find me all the errors in it, find me all the security flaws in it, things like that. So one fundamental question is, we understand that it can empower creative people, but what does that mean to IT services? What does that mean to software development? 
And this is a something, this is something that I think a lot about, obviously, and I used to talk about this 10 years ago um, in the Infosys days. Um, clearly, gen gen generative AI has a potential to be extremely disruptive to IT services. Um, the traditional model of building a piece of software or maintaining a piece of software, using software to upgrade a customer from one version of something to another, um, maintaining cybersecurity related landscapes, all of these things can be dramatically simplified and amplified with generative AI. So what is going on here? And in preparation for this talk, I, I thought about this. I think clearly all IT services companies have a lot of generative AI projects that they are working on. Um, if you look at the earnings calls from the IT services companies, they talk about we have 200 Gen AI projects or 500 Gen AI projects, etc. But at the same time, that those, I mean, which is wonderful, you know, it's great that they have all these Gen AI projects that they are doing. But the issue here is that Gen AI has a very big disruptive effect on the other 20,000 or 30,000 projects that they are working on, which are not generative AI projects. And so the way you can imagine, I have a stylized graph here, the way you can imagine this evolve is over time, the traditional projects that are run on the traditional time and materials kinds of metrics are clearly going to see a very severe decline. In, in many ways, that decline has started already. And so the only way forward is for the new projects, the red line down there, to grow equally fast uh, with new economics. And normally this is how this creative destruction is how the industry operates, except in this case, the advances in AI are making that decline happen very, very fast. And so my sense is that, uh, is these five points that I have written on the left-hand side, clearly AI um, can help transform the companies towards an AI-first company. The, it will need uh, augmenting people with AI-native software that is coupled with services. For example, if you had a project that had to be done that needed, let's say, 20 people, now you can probably do it with 10 together with some, some AI, or five even, and some AI. So if that AI is yours, if it is something, if it is an AI platform, that belongs to you, then you can offer the entire economics, the value to the customer, and still keep the margins. If the AI platform belongs to somebody else, uh, then they get to keep the margin. This was the entire point of giving the donation to OpenAI back then. There will clearly be a margin impact during this transition, and most importantly, it needs a business model change. And what I mean by that is that the way of pricing these projects uh, cannot only be time and materials anymore, obviously. You have to somehow find a way to either charge by outcomes or by um, include the software as a part of that equation. And this also means reskilling the people and, and giving them opportunities for being creative. My own work is in this area. What I see as a big opportunity where something like this can create the next millions of jobs is in simplifying existing IT complexity using a combination of AI and services. And this kind of a next generation services and AI software to simplify the existing landscape and to give business users tremendous power in how they do their work, in getting their work done much faster, much simpler, and in doing that, remove this complexity that sits inside the IT landscape today. To me, this is the next massive opportunity. That's what my own company, Vyan, uh, Vyan I, is focused on. So I see that I have a minute remaining. The bottom line is, um, is the decline in the old going to be greater than the growth in the new? Or are we going to be able to transition in time before the bottom falls off on the traditional projects? This, to me, is the fundamental question. About 1.5 million years ago, there were these stone tools that were made. Has anybody heard about this? Atirampakkam? It's a place in Tamil Nadu where they found these stone tools from between 1.5 million to 2 million years ago. Million years ago. We have always been building tools, you know. And 
what we have now, when you think about AI, and please take this from someone who has been around the field for almost 35 years now, um, it is a very powerful tool that we have built. That's all it is. It is a, in a way, it is an aggregation of all the training data that it can regurgitate to you in the form of poetry or essays or documents or in the form of software or anything else like that. It's a really powerful tool that we have. And um, what we do with it is, Eric Clapton gave this beautiful song uh, the year I graduated from Syracuse called, uh, It's in the Way That You Use It. Thank you so much.